So once again, we're in the book of Proverbs, and this evening I want to preach a sermon that's just entitled Get Wisdom, and it's a you know very broad topic, but this is something that has been on my mind recently, many reasons actually, it's kind of a multitude of things that have come together in my life that really prompt me to, to want to teach on this subject. Like I said, it's very broad, but um, I feel like there's a, there's a huge lack of Christians especially that are putting in the effort and the time to, to increase their knowledge and get wisdom. And it, it's so important. It's stressed so highly in Scripture, especially when we read the book of Proverbs. I mean, we see that. Look at verse number seven. If you just look down, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. As Christians, in order to grow, you need to be able to learn and add precept upon precept and line upon line, and we need to be able to know how to think. We need to know how to reason. We need to know, be, because this stuff all is, you know, you want to know more of the truth? Well, the truth makes sense. Amen. The truth is something that you can spell out that you can understand that you shouldn't have to go through a bunch of weird mental gymnastics. I'm not saying things aren't complicated, but I'll tell you what, the, the, the truth is, is, oh, good night. I, I, I'm, my mind is racing right now with all the things that I need to say about this subject and hopefully impart the desire for you to want to increase your wisdom and want to increase your knowledge and understanding. Christianity already has a view from many people just in the world of being, you know, for simpleton, stupid, oh, you need the crutch of the Bible, you need the crutch of God's Word and stuff. And, you know, it's a real shame when there are people who just really just have no intelligence. Now, look, thank God if you're saved and you can do a great work and you can be a good person and, and you know, live a much better life and have a very fulfilling life and still be able to serve God. But I'll tell you what, there, you know, if you're lacking wisdom, there's something seriously lacking in your life. Amen. And none of us are ever going to arrive at this goal either, right? We all are going to fall short. And, and obviously, we need to retain some humility and be able to understand that there's always going to be some things that are outside of understanding. But it, it's just like with anything. Just because we may never get there or just because we're always sinners doesn't mean we just throw up our hands and say, like, oh, yeah, whatever. Like, no, you always continue to strive and learn more and do a little bit here and a little bit there and continue to grow. I mean, so many people, so many Christians will complain about not being fed and everything else, but it's like, what are you doing to increase your wisdom? What are you doing to increase your knowledge? Are you doing anything... Are you expecting to always be spoon-fed? No, if you come to church and you ought to have a meal. There ought to be a good chunk of the Word of God for you to, to eat, you know, spiritually eat that meat and be able to digest and be able to grow and be able to learn. But not everywhere is, is putting that out there, but that doesn't mean that you still can't learn and grow. It's just going to mean it's going to be a little bit harder for you. You have to grow up a little bit quicker and you have to learn how to go get some food for yourself. And it's available. It's out there. But there was a, and this came to my mind during the Bible reading. I didn't even have this in my notes. But stay in Proverbs 4. I'll just read for you from Hebrews chapter 5, at the very end of Hebrews chapter 5, where the, the, the writer here is saying, you know, for when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. He's referring to people that, look, you've been in church for long enough. You've been around for a long time. For the time that you've been here, you ought to be teachers by now. Amen. But instead, you, are, you become such as just need milk. You're still just a baby. It's like you've been coming to church for three decades, and you're still just a baby. You're still drinking the milk. You still can't handle the, the more complicated subjects, the deeper subjects, the meat of God's Word, because you're still just not learning, because your wisdom hasn't increased. 
He says, For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe, but strong meat belongeth to them that are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And what is this talking about? It's talking about discerning good and evil. It's talking about knowing God's law. But how are you going to do that? Obviously, you need to be able to put that into practice too. So by reason of use, you're going to grow when you get more of the word of God and put it into practice and continue that cycle of receiving the word of God, working it out. Receiving, working. You're going to grow. You're going to build your spiritual muscles. You're going to, but you need, you need to have that constant influx of the word to receive the wisdom, but then you also need to do something with it. Amen. Pastor Brazen, that sounds like a lot of work. You, you're right. You better believe it. You are 100% right. It is a lot of work, which is why there's so many ignorant people in the world. Amen. Let alone among Christianity, but I mean, this is the world in general. There's so many people about, I think there's, there's more wise people among Christians than anywhere else, so don't get me wrong on that. The world has the world's wisdom, which some of it's good, but some of it's not, right? Some of it's just garbage. But the Word of God has true wisdom and truth and knowledge and all that we need, really, to understand and to live this life. But I'm telling you, we need to be well exercised and able to, for example, present an argument, to be able to reason and rationalize and be able to use the scripture and use the word of God and use common sense to express the truths and to convince people. Hey, why should I believe it? You should believe it because it's true. Amen. This isn't just some piece of fiction that we're asking you to put your faith in and believe. This is reality. This is truth. We're just trying to show you, look, this is real. Christ is real. The word of God is real. I mean, we're talking to a lady today that was trying to um, that, that was actually raised apparently with the right gospel because when I was saying, you know, trying to give her, she was real friendly and open, but I was trying to, to explain the gospel to her. She knew, she knew all of it. But she had gotten to this place where, like, she's, she had said she's not, uh, she's not really trusting the Bible, that it hasn't been corrupted and that it hasn't been changed. It's been translated so many times. And I said, well, it hasn't been translated so many times. And here's the thing. You're going to hear a lot of different arguments that people will make. And we need to hear it out, be able to think critically, and be able to respond when people have stumbling blocks that you might be able to help them with. Now, some people you might not be able to help at all. And this person, I don't know. Hopefully, I was able to help her. I, it's hard to say, but it was actually a really good conversation. And if you don't have wisdom and knowledge, that might just be someone that you just won't be able to, to help at all, right? And we want to be able to get as many people, lead as many people to Christ as possible. Amen. But this person was saying how, like, well, it's been translated so many times. I explained, like, no, look, it hasn't been, I mean, it's been translated in languages, but it's only translated once from Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, from the original languages to the new language. It does, it's not like it's just translated and then that's translated and that's translated and that's translated. That would be many translations. The translation goes, okay, from Greek and Hebrew to Spanish, from Greek and Hebrew to Polish, from Greek and Hebrew to English. So, so you've got, you still have an underlying source. And, you know, there's a lot involved in this and in, in dealing with people. You need, you know, you want to learn tact. There's so many things to learn, right? Dealing with people is another good form of wisdom to have. How to appropriately speak with people without just offending. I mean, what's your goal? You want to get this lead person to Christ? Okay, well, don't be a jerk about asking questions. Don't make them feel like an idiot because then they're not going to want to listen to you. No one's going to want to listen to you and it's kind of rude to make people feel like a moron even if they're not very intelligent at all. And I'm not saying this girl was intelligent. I'm just saying that like you, you know, understand the situation and understand how to even talk with people. And look, wisdom is going to help you with all of this. And I explained, I was like, she's trying to say how some of this stuff just doesn't really mean what they thought it meant and all this other stuff. And I said, well, I asked very politely, do you, do you happen to know Greek or Hebrew for yourself? Is this something that you've studied? 
not making the assumption, not just automatically thinking I know what they know, which by the way, people do this all the time and it kind of grinds my gears a little bit. It really, it's, it, people are always making assumptions on what you know, you don't know this and you, that didn't even come up or whatever. Like how could you just assume you know what someone else knows? Don't ever do that, okay? This wants to go, again, with being wise. But then when you start doing that, now you, your conversation is going to be unfruitful. You start making all these assumptions back and forth and then it turns into a fight, then an actual fruitful conversation. So you just ask. Oh, okay. Oh, so you don't know this. Neither do I. I don't know those languages either. But in order now for you to come to the conclusion that there's something wrong, with the Bible, you have to read that from somebody else who's claiming that there's these problems and claiming that, the, that this would mean something different than what the translator was translated. So, so you have to trust somebody. So now you got to put like, like, how do you know that they're not lying to you? And if you look up that, you read that person and read about these complaints, well, I guarantee you, you've got other people who are going to defend and say, no, that absolutely is right. So it goes back to, now you still have to make a judgment call. You still have to trust something. What are you going to believe? And I just said, doesn't it just make sense that you already believe God's real? You know he's there. Doesn't it make sense that if there's a God that's real, that he wants you to understand and know about him? And isn't it, wouldn't it be not that hard to, to imagine that he's able to preserve his word? Last shoulder, Psalm 12, and just kind of explain that. Like I used the word of God and just said, hey, look, I mean, this is God's the one saying that he's going to preserve his words. Yeah. Now look, this is just an example of being able to reason with people. But in order to reason, you need to be able to learn how to think reasonably. And you also need to learn it for yourself. Because when you start getting into more in-depth conversations, you will not just be able to repeat something you've heard. You have to know it. Because you have to be able to explain it, you have to be able to teach it, and you can't do that if you don't know it for yourself. Amen. Let's go through this passage a little bit. There's so much here. There's so, so much to get into. Look at verse number five. Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not. Neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Now look, we already read Proverbs 8, and I could go back to it from this morning. The personification of wisdom, we're seeing the same thing again here. If you don't forsake wisdom, then she shall preserve you, is what I'm saying. She's going to help you continue on. Now, getting the wisdom from God's word, it helps you in your day-to-day -day life. Just the practicality of it. Not just being some supernatural blessing from God, but literally just, hey, God's telling you what you should do in this life. If you follow God's advice, it will preserve you. God teaches you how to spot the pitfalls. And that's why Proverbs is so full of the warning about the strange woman, about the fornication, about getting close to someone and going the wrong path and following the wrong way and getting into sin. And it talks a lot about alcohol and drunkenness. And it talks a lot about being lazy and a sluggard. And it talks about these basic aspects of human life because God is telling you the right way. And look, if you do the right thing, God, it, it will just preserve you. It's going to help your life to, to be able to live longer and live better. Uh, love her and she shall keep thee. Very similar to preserve. Wisdom is a principal thing, of course. Therefore, get wisdom with all that getting, get understanding. Exalt her and she shall promote thee. You will get promoted by learning more wisdom. You want that honor? You want that promotion? Learn more. Put in the time, put in the effort to gain wisdom and gain understanding. She shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. You receive the honor because when, when a person is wise, other people around you are going to take notice. 
When someone's always able to give good advice, when someone's always able to give good counsel, when someone always is able to use their wisdom, they can see things that are going to happen, not because there's some profit of being able to literally like see some things happening in a vision or in a dream, but because they see patterns and they're able to identify, hey, look, I read about this in the Word of God. I know about my history. I know about these things that have happened, and I can see this is going to happen again. Amen. That's through wisdom. And then people will pay attention to that, and you know, by default, you, you'll, you'll end up getting promoted and being honored because of that wisdom. She shall give to thine head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory she shall, or shall she deliver to thee. Hear, O my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of thy life shall be many. This is going to help you to live a long life. I have taught thee in the way of wisdom. I have led thee in right paths. When thou goest, thy steps shall not be straightened. And when thou runnest, thou shalt not stumble. Now, I actually made this, I wrote a note down here, and I totally skipped over it. But this was also something that came up recently. Because one of the things that's prominent in this are all the comments that we've been receiving about how we're racist and all this other stuff. And, and people literally like just are having an extremely hard time being coherent with the argumentation. It's just like, rolling accusation, rolling accusation, saying things you didn't say, making, you know, coming up with all these implications from words that were said that had nothing to do with what they're trying to throw. It's like, people, if people could just learn how to think and hear and understand, there'd be a lot less problems in general. That's one area, and I'm going to get more into that too, because a lot of it has to do with people's emotions getting out of control and clouding your judgment in clouding wisdom. And the two go hand in hand. If you want to be wise, you're going to have to learn how to temper your emotions and control yourself to be able to continue to think rationally and not allow bitterness, not allow pride and other emotions to get in the way of being able to still communicate effectively and being wise towards whatever the situation is. The other thing that came up recently, I literally just saw this video where this organization, I think they're in Washington, D.C., they had, this guy has this agenda of trying to say that, like, like, against KJV only, okay? And I don't know much about his background. I literally just saw it. I didn't, I didn't get his credentials or anything, but, but he works for, like a, like, a Bible history organization or something to that effect. And this is a former KJV only guy who's now trying to make the defense for, see, we, you know, the, the, the language is, is kind of outdated, so he's trying to, to make this argument, and what he did, but here's the thing, his conclusion is way wrong, but he did a, a, a survey, and I think it was a thousand KJV-only pastors they contacted and asked 20 questions, and what he said was, so the advocates of, of the King James Version, like we are, we're a KJV only church, will say, will state that, um, you know, one of the reasons why this is superior is because of the use of the these and thous and the yees and yous, because it will differentiate the plural versus the singular every time. So it's really easy to be able to understand what someone is is saying you, it means y'all, right? Instead of uh, the, it means that, that particular person. So since that argument is used so frequently, he asked 10 questions and gave 10 examples where all, all they had to do was, was to say whether it was, uh, whether the word was, the pronoun was a, a singular or a plural. And look, this guy that made the study, he's, he's absolutely right. The rule applies across the board. So you can literally just look without even knowing what the verse is about. If it says you or ye, it's plural. If it says thee or thou, it's singular. That's just the way it works. Okay? And the results of these, all these pastors were horrendous of getting those answers right. And you know what that is? A shame. Amen. It's a shame. For a pastor especially. Now, not everybody 
that hears from the word of God is going to know all these things. But you know what I think? I think we all have a responsibility, a duty to do our own due diligence and learn for ourselves Amen. and want to gain that wisdom. Look, the teachers and the pastors should be able to help you to get there and, and help you along the way. But it's going to require still your own legwork. So they got a lot of that way wrong. And then there's another 10 questions where he was trying to find uh, false friends. So does anyone know what a false friend is in, in any language, right? So if you have two words that are, that are similar, but they mean totally different things. So he's giving these examples and saying, well, hey, what does, uh, and here's one that I commonly bring up when I teach the Bible is conversation. Who's heard me talk about conversation, right? Conversation isn't just what we would talk about as being like, I talked to Brother Devin and say we had a conversation. In our modern terminology, we'll use that word in that way. Whereas in the Bible, the meaning was a little bit different. The English meaning conversation meant more with how you live your life than it did actually just having some verbal communication with somebody else. There are other words like this in the scripture. And again, he was, so he was asking like, well, what about, what does this word mean in this verse? What does this word mean? You know, and, and gave them all these different examples. And apparently they didn't do that great in those either. But that still doesn't prove, his point was just to say, well, see, look, since the modern language is, you know, is different from the language, from the English language that the, the King James Bible was used in, then it's obviously, even if it's better, because he even conceded that like the V and the was better to have that in there than not. But his point was, well, if they can't even get it right anyways, then what's the point? And then he gave the modern version saying that even though it said you, it would, it would oftentimes include other words so that you could understand that it was referring to more than one person. They'd add a word like, uh, I, I forget specific examples, but like saying you all, right? And it doesn't do that in the modern version, but, but that, it doesn't say you all, y'all, but, but they would use other words to make it known that you're talking. So he's saying, like, you're still getting the point across. But the big, I mean, the big problem, though, is that it's not about, the, between the modern versions and the King James Version, isn't just about readability or understanding a few particular words. It's about the source. Amen. What about the source underlying documents that you're translating from? It's not just about, oh, well, this one's just a little bit easier to read because it's a little bit more similar to the language we use today. But, but see, it, if, you, if you look at that, you might be like, oh, wow, well, he's got this great point here. It's like, look, the only great point he has is, one, those pastors need to learn more. And two, you know, it's what he's, if, if you could do the same exact thing with any of those modern versions, I've seen the lists of words and looked them up of the weird words that are not common in language today from modern versions of the Bible. They all have them because they all have to be copyrighted, so they all have to find synonyms and other words to use so they can copyright a, wor a work as being a different book than all the rest of the Bible, a different version. So, of course, you're going to run into that nonsense. So, here's the thing. We have to deal with this, though, of saying, no, look, the King James is right because they had the right underlying text, because it came from the received text, because there wasn't any issue or problem with this when this was translated. But the problem is our language has changed a little bit. So, there's going to be some work now involved to make sure that we understand that the words we're reading didn't actually mean something a little bit different when it was translated. Amen. So that requires some work. Great. But it's not such a huge issue that all of a sudden now, well, now we just need to change and just get a whole new translation of the Bible. We don't need to do that. How about we just learn the 50 words or whatever that, that we need to do? In fact, if you're interested, I have a book of archaic words in the King James Bible that literally just spells them out for you and just says, yeah, there's this and this and this. And it can help you to understand what different words mean. In fact, I think I'll probably go through a series on that because it sounds like fun. And it's good to know and it's good to teach. We always want to ever be learning and ever understanding more and increasing 
our wisdom so that we do know what we're talking about. So then when a, a, a guy like this comes along that wants to say, oh, yeah, you could just use any old Bible and it doesn't you know, really matter and tries to come and give you, try to stump you on something that you won't be stumped. Now, look, we don't know everything. And there's a couple of examples that he used that I didn't know. But instead of, instead of being bristling at that or responding negatively, it's like, well, hey, cool, now I learned something new. I'm going to look this up and verify because I'm not just going to trust this guy. But all the other things he was saying were, were right on. So, okay, great. I didn't know that before. I would have gotten that one wrong or whatever, but now I won't. <laughs> Because <laughs> I've learned the truth, right? And let's keep moving forward. We don't ditch the Bible because it's like, oh, you didn't understand something. Give me a break. And half the time, too, some of the problems that he was marking wrong, 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 you know, because it's kind of like yes or no, is it right or wrong? There, there are passages when he was asking about the you, well, it's a singular plural, it's a singular plural. There are passages that you would teach to the individual, right? Even though it's spoken to everybody, they're just statements that everyone would individually apply to themselves. And when you preach it, of course you're going to apply it to yourself. And there's nothing wrong with teaching it that way. Even though technically it is written to all, there's nothing wrong with teaching it like it's for you. Amen. Anyways, that, there, there's... There's so many reasons to learn. Let's go back to Proverbs chapter 2. And especially in our children. We need to teach our children how to think. And exalt wisdom. It, it ought to be something that's lifted up in the home. And especially in a church like ours where we uh, advocate, I advocate for homeschooling. I think it's a great option. I think it's great to not run your children through the state indoctrination centers. I think you ought to know what your children are being taught. I think it's important. But just because we believe that doesn't mean that you should just go for the, the dumbest down education that you could possibly get your kids without getting thrown in jail or something. Right? We want our kids to learn. I want them to grow. I want them to have a better education than they would get in any other institution. I want to teach them to learn how to learn. I want to teach them to, to, to have an appreciation for understanding and wisdom and, and see what that good is going to do for you. The book of Proverbs is continually emphasizing, my son, listen to me, my son, my son, my son, hear my words, receive my instruction. This is so important for you. You don't even understand how much this is important for you. Please receive this. Please hold tight to these words. Please get this in your head. It will preserve you. It will give you life. It will help you, give you long days. This will guide you in the right way. You need the wisdom. Amen. And our children need to understand, and it's more than just reading. Look, the Bible is the primary source of all our truth, but I believe this too. Look, we ought to be intelligent enough to be able to, to, to study God's creation as well and study other things in this world and try to understand them and understand how things operate because for as long as I've been around in this life, there is, it is amazing how much understanding you receive when you start to learn about different areas of God's creation in various, so many ways, so many different things. Whether it be animals, plants, biology, chemistry, all these various areas of interest, language, they're fascinating, but as you start to learn in different areas, it helps you to learn overall with other things that are related that you never would have thought were related, but then you start to see other patterns existing, it's, it's absolutely incredible. And what's exciting about that for me is because I know I'm just barely scratching the surface in some of these areas, and it's just like, wow, this is so cool, this is so intense. We need to get that love for learning and understanding and desire to grow. And instead of just plopping down on the couch and hitting the remote control and turning the television on, that you can open up a book or start reading and doing some research and doing some understanding and getting some wisdom, open up the Bible and get some good wisdom from the Word of God. That is going to add so much more value than just the brain dead time. 
Proverbs 2, look at verse number 1. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasure. So, I mean, this is elevating the, the pursuit of wisdom. Like, look, hey, if, if, if I had a treasure map, right, and you knew of all this gold and all this silver that you could find, like, how much would you invest in that and be like, oh, man, I'm going to check this out. I'm going to see where I can find this. Like, everybody would do that. Right. Oh, I got the secret treasure. He's saying that's how you need to be viewing wisdom. That's how you need to be approaching the Word of God and getting this wisdom. Forget about the stupid riches. Look, you get smarts. That stuff can come anyways. You can be blessed with that stuff. You could use the intelligence to get, wiz to get the, 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 the goods anyways. Now, we shouldn't be caring about the, the physical goods, but I'll tell you what, the more you have up here, the more options you're going to have too, just in general. Then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. You want to find the knowledge of God? I mean, who doesn't want the knowledge of God? Well, seek for it, man. Put it forth the effort. That's what the previous verses were just saying. Seek for it like silver. Verse 6, For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. When wisdom entereth into thine heart and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee understanding shall keep thee to deliver thee from the way of the evil man from the man that speaketh forward things and then the passage will continue to go on about more in detail about the forward man about the the people who are going to try to set snares and traps for you and he's saying look when you've got wisdom it's in your heart and when that knowledge is pleasant to your soul you like receiving and increasing your knowledge your discretion, being discreet, being able to, to differentiate between the good and the evil, between the right and the wrong, and having an understanding that's going to keep you, that's going to preserve you, that's going to keep you out of the way of the evil person. Amen. You won't fall into those traps. Daniel was wise. The Bible says that, you know, uh, Daniel was, was one of the most wise people. You know, talking about the excel, excelling the wisdom of Daniel. Daniel had great wisdom, great understanding. He sought after it. He, he, he continually tried to increase his wisdom, his learning, his understanding. And Daniel was someone who was also upright. So he took what he learned, and the people that hated him, he wasn't falling into their traps. They had nothing to say. He was preserved through the wisdom that he received by the word of God. He increased his wisdom enough. He was also elevated. He also received honor. He also had all these... Now look, people hated him because he was a believer, because you know, they envied him, because they were covetous of him. But he did that which was right, and he was preserved, and he was kept, just as the Bible says. Turn through to Proverbs chapter 5. Of course, in order to receive understanding and knowledge, number one, you have to be humble. If you think you know everything, you won't learn anything. Amen. What do you teach the person that knows everything? Nothing, because they know everything. They won't be taught. They can't learn. So in order to learn, in order to increase wisdom, in order to, to be able to continue to grow, you must be humble. I don't care how much you know. You need to be humble. In fact, people who are blowhards, it's often a sign that they really don't know much at all. I was watching an, another, again, another thing in, in this whole series of events that was really got my mind on this subject. Does anyone know who Dave Farina is? He's also known as Professor Dave on YouTube. Anyone at all? 
Okay, a couple people might have known him, whatever. He's this atheist. Now, I was exposed to him because he has some good videos uh, rebuking flat earthers <laughs> on the stupidity of, of what they believe. But, but he's like really rabid, though, against creationists and against the things of God and against the Bible. I mean, he's rabid against this stuff. He hates the Bible. He hates creationism and stuff. So I just saw this video of this guy who's a Christian, and he is a, um, he's a professor at, I forget the university, but he's been, he's like the foremost professor in chemistry and like he has tons of publications, very well uh, reputed in the scientific community, okay? And he was stating, he said he, he gave five things that if you, you know, if, if anyone could answer these five things, talking about biogenesis. Biogenesis meaning how life originated from non-life. So there's certain elements that need to have existed for life to even come about, and you need to have uh, proteins, and you need to have these, you know, there's, there's building blocks that need to exist in order for anything to even come together to even try to have life be created. So the, the modern textbooks will tell you things like there's this primordial sludge or whatever and lightning strikes it and then all of a sudden there's life and it's like we don't really know how it happened but like it had to have happened because we're all here so that's their theory and the like as he's, he's learned and grown and, and increases wisdom in this field of study he knows it really well really well and he's saying it's it's impossible for these things to happen like it just it just can't happen so but there's all these claims always being made by other people in the scientific community that are saying oh yeah we're already able to create this stuff in the lab and create this stuff and he's and he's calling them out and saying like no you didn't because there's all kinds of of variables they got to take care of of like well this is a, a prebiotic earth and and to have this whole system that this earth evolved from whatever there's a lot of things that didn't exist you can't have uh any type of organisms living until life comes into existence right so you have to isolate all this stuff and there's chemical reactions and look it, it, it's it gets really complicated but this guy had then this debate with the youtuber and the entire, th I mean, it's kind of hard to watch because all the YouTuber can do, this Professor Dave, was just rail on him and rail on him. He's just like, wow, oh, this guy's a liar. And he couldn't explain anything. He's just like, well, see, look, there's this white paper and this white paper. But he didn't understand what those papers were. It's just a guy who's saying like, oh, I did my research in here. Well, you just can't answer this and you can't answer this. And he's like, no, explain to me how it works. Here's a piece of chalk. Here's a chalkboard. Go up and show me literally how it works. But he couldn't do it because he didn't understand it. And he looks like a fool. Yeah. Well, the other guy's writing it up. He's like, look, this is what we get. Here is the, the, the um, composition of this molecule. And how do we get this into that? How can he do it? Show me. And the guy can't do it. He's getting called out, right? right? So as you do, he just resorts to name calling. He resorts to just all kinds of, of verbal assault to cover up the fact that he doesn't really know what he's talking about. And this is what people do. And it's a defense mechanism. And what I'm saying, all of that said to say this is, look, we as believers need to be prepared, Amen. right? We need to study to show ourselves approved unto God. You may not have the, the expertise in, you know, uh, in chemistry or whatever, but it still does good. Like, I think it's great that there's this guy that has this great level of respect and understanding in that scientific community to call out the lies of someone who really does know what they're talking about and give credibility to the truth. And we need people just in all areas of life to know what they're talking about. So take your job seriously, learn about that. Learn, you know, whatever you do, just to be able to see through and, and call out the lies. 
just like even just with the King James Bible, for example, it's good to have people that know Greek and know Hebrew just to be able to defend the Bible, right? Just to be able to say, no, look, I do know this and, and hear and, and, and give all the evidence and give all the reasons. Obviously, I don't believe that you have to know Greek or Hebrew to understand the Bible. We have it perfectly translated for us in English, and you don't have to have learned all of the languages to come to that understanding. But it's good to have people that understand those things and that know that, that can speak authoritatively so that when someone else tries to come along, you can just shut them down with truth, with truth, with, with the knowledge, with the wisdom, with the understanding. This is one area, thankfully, of all the areas and all the different things we can do with our life. You know, as you grow older, your body changes. You're not physically able to do all of the things that you've been able to do necessarily in the past, but as long as you have your mind, you could always increase wisdom and understanding and continue to flex that muscle up here and to gain that wisdom, obviously until you get Alzheimer's or something that's a degenerative disease that might cause you to, to not be able to retain that stuff, but you can do so much more and, and continue to grow in that capacity for a very long time. And even if you've wasted tons of years of your life, hey, I've wasted tons of years of my life too, but change that now. Just get into it, get going. We need to be humble. Look at what I was saying, Proverbs chapter five, verse number one, my son, attend unto my wisdom and bow thine ear to my understanding. And, and you know, I'm going to speak to, to the children, especially teenagers. I was a teenager before. Your parents were teenagers before. I feel you. I understand. I do under, whether you think I do or not, I understand. And there's many teenagers that have a lot of good ideas and are coming into their own and understanding a lot of things. But I'll tell you what, don't get so lifted up and proud that you just think you know more than all the adults. Because you don't. I remember being there and I was foolish when I thought the very same things. There's something about having decades of experience that gives you a lot of wisdom way more than your whatever, however many years, teen number of years. And, and seriously, you'll do well and you'll increase the knowledge you already have by being able to bow down your ear and receive the wisdom and receive the understanding. You will just get that much smarter. There's even, there's even a scientific study done that will, that will explain how some people, when they start to learn a little bit about something, maybe more than your average person, they think they are now an expert, but then when the more time you spend continuing to learn, continuing to understand, your perception of how much you know starts to go down pretty quickly when you start to realize how much more there really is to learn and understand about given subject. And the people who truly are experts in their area still will be like, yeah, we're just barely starting to understand this. Amen. And it's true. Amen. And that's why you need to remain humble and not over speak and not overstate. And look, if you want to have credibility, you can't just blow off your mouth and be like, well, you just have to believe me because I'm the expert. And no, we don't. They did that with COVID and we see where that got us. Yep. You have to stay six feet away from each other because the experts say so. Well, what about six feet, one inches? What about five foot, 10 inches? What about, you know, whatever. The experts said so. Yeah, the expert said to wear a mask, and the expert said not to wear a mask, and the expert said to wear a mask, and then it, you know. but that, but that, see, here's the thing. I'm not saying there's no experts, but the people that just want to be the blowhards and just tell you what you need to do and just believe me because I say so, those are the ones that you don't believe. Prove it. Show me why. Prove it. That's how you then we'll determine if you're going to be able to receive something or not. Psalm 119 says this. Turn if you go to Proverbs 26. We'll stay, you could say in Proverbs. Psalm 119, verse 97 says, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. 
Thou, through thy commandments, hast made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. Through God's commandments, studying the Bible, he said, that's made me wiser than mine enemies, they're ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. Meditate on the word of God. Study the word of God. You get this truth in you. And whatever, you're, you know, you can surpass your own teachers and have that much more understanding than they do because they're not meditating on the word of God and you are. I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. And, then, and that's the other part of it. I keep thy precepts. Right? You keep it in memory. You keep it in heart. And you put it into practice. Don't be lazy. Proverbs 26, 16, the Bible says, The sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. The lazy person, the sluggard, it says they, they themselves just think that they're real smart. Right? They're wiser in their own conceit, in their own conceited mind. They're so full of themselves. They just think they're so wise. And you say, oh, yeah, I'm smarter than seven men. That can actually give a reason. That can actually prove something. It actually has wisdom. The, the lazy person just wants to rely on, well, yeah, well and, just, and just speak something and want to believe it in their heart, even though they don't have any facts to back up what they're saying. But that's a lazy person. We can't be lazy. To flip uh, forward, if you were to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse number 9, right there. It's right near the end of the book of Ecclesiastes. Just kind of closing it out. We start reading verse number 9. The Bible reads, And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. And verse 8 is, you know, vanity of vanities. All is vanity, saying it's all kind of meaningless. But he says, moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Hey, the preacher's wise. So he's saying, you know, I still need to teach people to know things, to get wisdom. Yea, he have good heed and he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. And further, by these, my son, be admonished, for making, of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh." It is a weariness. It does consume you. It does take energy and suck your energy out of you when you try to learn. Because you have to stay focused. You have to be paying attention. You have to, to try to understand things that might be foreign to you. But it's worth the effort. It's worth the effort. And I would suggest this. Complement your Bible reading. Complement the Word of God. Complement your Bible memory with even just some other education outside of Scripture. Now look, primary, first, 100%, most important, is the Bible. Memorize it, know it, this will guide you. This will give you the most important knowledge and wisdom that you could ever possibly need. But you know what? It's amazing because when you learn things that are true, hey, truth is truth. And knowing the truth is going to continue to help you. And it does add value. And, and it's going to help you to hopefully be able to win over the naysayers and the people that want to argue against what the Bible says especially. And the more knowledge you have, the more you can defend what the Scripture says and be able to win over, if not the person who's the naysayer, the ignorant person who's just hearing what this other person has to say like I was trying, attempting to do with the young lady that I was speaking to about, oh, well, I, can't, I don't think I could trust the Bible. Well, why? Because some other guy wrote a book? Present reasons, present an argument, give some understanding, and then question that and say, how do you know that you can trust that person? You don't know this for yourself. How about you expand a little bit? How about you think about it this way? This might be able to help you to come to a good conclusion on that instead of just blindly trusting what some person says. 
But people need to hear that, right? I mean, look, if, if people are ignorant, they're ignorant. Like, obviously, you want to help with that. And people ought to strive to learn. Once she even said, she's like, look, I'm on my journey. I'm still trying to figure this out. I don't have all the answers. Great, humble person to, to want to learn and grow. But it was this attitude of just like, well, I want to know more. And this is, look, it's the same attitude I had when I was young. So I didn't want to accept Christianity because uh, that's how I was raised. Well, I didn't see what else was out there. What are the other, what do other religions say? What, what, what are the options? What are people saying? What, what's, what other type of information can I receive and see and judge and determine and say what's right? Seeking the truth. And we ought to be able to help, especially those who are more spiritually mature, be able to help those that are seeking to find the truth. Help them to find it. I'm currently researching things about understanding more about alcohol, the chemical impact. I already know a lot about this, and you all know how I feel about this, but also the history and all these other things because people say a lot of stupid things that I know are not true, but I want to be able to prove it untrue and not just say it with nothing to back it up. And you know what? I think that that will be valuable and help somebody out there. Now, look, we already know what the Bible says, but I want to help to destroy the people who want to upend the word of God with some other argument and just be like, no, that's bogus. That's not what, the, you know, the word of God isn't just saying that everything is alcoholic and that, and that it was impossible for people to ever have juice back in those days, thousands of years ago. No, that, that's ridiculous. There's so many areas where you can... You can add a lot of value, and the more wisdom, and the more understanding, and the more learning, and the more education, real education you get, the better off it's going to be. And going back to the, you know, the people who call us racist and all this stuff, you don't know your history, and you don't know the Bibles in Africa, and you don't know all this stuff. It's like, no, you don't know. It's like, we know where the Bible came from. Amen. We know it was in the Middle East. And no, we don't think that Europeans had to save these people. It's like, that's, we're not saying any of that. But these people don't know. Don't you know that the people who were enslaved and brought over here were vast majority not Christians? Amen. Like the vast majority. But don't you know the gospel was there? But they didn't get it. Don't you know that? Because they weren't saved when they came over here. Well, couldn't they have gotten it? At, well, yeah, they could have, but they didn't. Right, yeah. After 1,500 years, they didn't. It's not that they couldn't, but they didn't. So praise God that many of them got the gospel here and got saved. Amen. And who cares what the stinking skin color was of the person that got them saved? That doesn't even matter. Sorry, I'm still upset. People are still commenting about that. Thanks, Brother Devin. <laughs> oh, perfect verse. Let's go back to Proverbs 14. I got way too many notes and I'm not going through them all, so don't worry. But this is such a huge topic in Scripture. There's so much here about wisdom, about knowledge, about understanding, and how we can achieve that and what we need to do to, to help with that. You know, being humble, great. We need to be able to, um, to, to receive the Word of God and, and, and acknowledge that we don't know everything so that we can learn and we can grow and we can receive more. Also, not letting your emotions get the better of you. As I mentioned previously, look at verse, excuse me, verse number 29 of Proverbs 14. But it says, he that is slow to wrath is of great understanding. But he that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. Folly is foolishness. It's essentially the opposite of, of having great understanding. Right? It's a foolish thing. If you can allow yourself to not be easily provoked, to not be just quick to, to wrath, right? Allow people to say things to you that are insulting without getting offended. Keep your cool. That's, that, that's already a level of understanding that you exhibit when you can retain your composure, keep your cool, not just when you're reviled, revile again, right? That's, Jesus didn't do any of that. And he's our example. So the wise person is going to look to that example and be like, yeah, actually... What he did was more powerful than having a better comeback to the guy who wants to rip on you. 
it's so much more powerful when someone tries to throw words at you to cut you down or ooh, that was a burn when you don't have to say anything but then you can just come back with truth because everyone who's watching while they may be like ooh, wow, he said something to you that was you know like how could you take that like I don't care because he's a fool right the foolish person could spout off their mouth and they could get all angry and they could get it hot and just start throwing words at you. But if you could in turn then respond with truth, hey, the truth fears no uh, um, scrutiny, right? Look it up. We ought to be able to speak truth so that, hey, go ahead, challenge me on it. Look at verse number six there in Proverbs 14. The Bible says, A scorner seeketh wisdom and findeth it not, but knowledge is easy unto him that understandeth. Go from the presence of a foolish man when thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge. And that is a good nugget of wisdom right there. Okay? It just got done talking about the scorner. Hey, he seeks wisdom, he doesn't find it. And then it's like, okay, when you find the foolish man, because the fool doesn't want to receive knowledge and understanding. The fool thinks they already know everything. So when you are in the presence of a foolish man, he's like, depart. Just go away from that guy when you perceive not in him the lips of knowledge. Like that guy just doesn't even have any understanding. So I'm not going to get involved in this fight or debate or argument, the wisdom of the prudent, verse 8, is to understand his way. But the folly of fools is deceit. Fools make a mock at sin, but among the righteous there is favor. Jump down to verse number 15. Again, in, in increasing our wisdom and our understanding and learning, don't be like the simple. Verse 15 says, The simple believeth every word. People say something, you don't just believe it. Challenge it. The Bible even says, hey, try the spirits, whether they're of God, right? We need to, to know. If someone's preaching to you, try that. Test it. How do you test it? Against the Word of God, against the Bible. And if someone wants to come at you, just, just saying any other thing, just trying to get you to, to do something or believe something, don't just accept it. Try it. Test it. Don't be simple. Don't just believe everything that everyone says, but the prudent man looketh well to his going. A wise man feareth and departeth from evil. You get the wisdom, you start to understand these things, you see, like, oh, I don't want to put myself in an evil situation. I'm just going to go this way. But the fool rageth and is confident. It's funny. It's not funny, but it is funny when people see someone who's just has a lot of confidence, they can trick people into thinking that they know what they're talking about. But so many times they're really just fools that they could rage, they could be confident, but they have no substance. Okay, don't be that guy. Don't be the, the guy that's, that's uh, the, the wicked guy that rages in his confidence. Be the wise guy. The wise, the wise guy. Be the, <laughs> don't be a wise guy either. Be a wise man that fears and departs from the evil. Right? And, and is able to understand, like, well, hey, when there's an area that's too great for you or something that, that you know, I can't just do everything. Well, I'm going to avoid this evil. And, and, but the fool, hey, man, they're just going to be confident and they're going to rage and, and walk right into whatever. He that is soon angry dealeth foolishly, and a man of wicked devices is hated. The simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. I'm deciding right now. I want to turn to maybe just one more place. There's so many other things. Yeah, okay, we'll close with this. Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 3. While you're turning there, I'll just read really quickly from Proverbs 18, verse number 1. 
Proverbs 18 verse 1 says, Through desire a man having separated himself seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. Through desire, it requires work. It requires effort. You need to want to have the wisdom because it's going to take time to learn. In Proverbs 18 13 too, I don't know, I almost missed this. One of my favorite verses to quote to people, especially quote to people online, he that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. Amen. And look, don't, it, this isn't, that. keep this in mind, this isn't just for you to throw at someone else, right. Right. you internalize that too. Yeah. It's important for both, right? Like, look, it is a folly and shame for people just to, to, to just start answering a matter. I already know what you're going to say. Well, you know what? Maybe you don't. Do you have ESP? Right? Like, <laughs> let people, give them an opportunity to speak and then answer. Right? Let, let, them, let them say what they need to say and then, and then answer. But, you know, we've been, we've been dealing, unfortunately, with a lot of that, of people just wanting to correct and say all this other stuff. It's like, you didn't even, did you listen to the whole thing in context? I keep saying, I keep asking people, well, I saw this video on TikTok. Did you watch the whole thing in context? You're going to call us racist. It's like the whole sermon was not about racism. You didn't even hear the matter. You got one clip and you got all upset and offended and, and raging. And, and now you're, you know, oh, I'm going to go down there. I'll tell you, you know, like, okay. You're just angry. That does nobody any good. At all. It doesn't do you any good. You just sit there and get all mad. Doesn't do me any good. If I'm wrong, that's still not doing me any good. Someone is getting all angry and, and chewing me out, but it's like, I'm sitting here going, but you didn't even hear. You're not even listening. So, of course, I'm not going to think I'm wrong about something when you're just flapping your gums and not, and not hearing a matter. You just want to answer it without hearing. But let's turn that also around on ourselves and make sure that you just think you don't think you know everything and now you start stop listening to what other people have to say. It is a good exercise. I was listening to this guy, I was intrigued to what he had to say about the pastors that, that he was saying didn't know the, the, the rule, the grammar rules and stuff like that. And when people want to challenge King James Oleism, when people want to challenge whatever. I think it's a good exercise to listen to what other people have to say. Because I'll tell you what, even if someone may be wrong on their overall view, they still might be right in some points. And if they can prove themselves to be right in those points, then hey, I want to get right. I want the truth. Like that video I was referencing, I'm glad I was listening to something that's a total opposing viewpoint and kind of mocking King James Oliest, but I learned something out of that, and I'm going to continue now to, to try to improve. But I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater and just being like, oh, yeah, okay, well, we're just going to use any Bible now because you showed a few examples of pastors who didn't understand what those words meant in the King James Bible. Like, no. That's not enough. Sorry. Fail. 1 Peter 3, verse 15, the Bible says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Amen. You don't have to give railing for railing. You don't have to revile when you're reviled. Just do right. Let them be ashamed of what they say about you falsely when you just continue to, to do right. And be ready to give an answer. Right? Now, specifically, this is saying uh, uh, for those that ask you a reason of the hope that is in you. Right? Amen. And that's the most important thing. So they could understand salvation. We know why we have this hope in us. But Really, if you think about it, the reason why we have that hope is it, it can become a little bit more complicated as to why do I have this, this hope that's in me. The easy answer is, well, because I believe in Jesus. That's the easy answer, right? And there's nothing untruthful about that, but you could continue to dig down the layers of, well, why do you believe Jesus? Well, because the Bible says so. Well, why do you believe the Bible? Right? And you can see how you could continue to 
follow that same path where you're ultimately still answering the reason of the hope that is in you and, and be able to, to give still good, solid reasons behind all of the things that we believe. And if we believe things that are stupid or false, obviously we want to change that. But you won't know, you won't know that unless you increase your knowledge, <laughs> right? How, how do you know something that you don't know? You need to learn it. It doesn't just, wow, I just, you know, we're not, you don't, you, you don't just get to plug into the matrix and just like download knowledge, okay? You have to work at it. And look, I, that movie's not, I hate that movie, but <laughs> work at it. It's worth it. It's probably as I have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we love you. I pray that you would please help us as a church. Help us to have good doctrine. Help us to have good understanding of your word. Help us to be good teachers of your word, Lord. Help us to not get weary in our flesh. There's so many things that we that we need to do, just spiritually speaking, so we can grow, whether that be reaching people with the gospel and praying and uh, um, you know, learning the Bible, memorizing the scripture, dear Lord, and even just being able to go into other areas and just learning other aspects of your creation and the world around us, Lord, help us to be able to uh, not get weary in our well-doing. And please increase our understanding. We, we have a thirst and a desire to just know more of the truth uh, that we can be that much more effective. And Lord, please, as you increase our understanding, as you open up that wisdom, help us to uh, make the applications necessary in our lives so that you can continue to show us more uh, wisdom from your word. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.